Well, this is the last Sunday of the year 2020, and what a year it has been. Truly a challenging one, a very trying one. Our faith has been tested severely. Our resolve has been tested, but we thank God that he brought us through. And as I have mentioned the last time we were together, he has preserved us. He has protected us and he has divinely provided for us. So as we close the year out and we enter a new one, I was impressed by the Spirit of God to do a series of lessons on the importance of understanding the call of God on our life and the challenges we face in the very core. I believe God had me choose this theme on purpose in order to take our eyes and our attention away from what is going on around us in the natural realm, with all the fear that is being communicated, all the anxiety and the uncertainty this pandemic has brought into our world, and of course, fix our eyes on Jesus and his plan and his purpose for our life. So the theme of my entire series of messages that may go into four or five messages, I'm not sure yet, is entitled Defining the Upward Call of God and the challenges we face in fulfilling that call. Today it will be part one, and we are going to look at the importance and the key to discovering that very purpose and fulfilling the call of God on our lives. I believe that every person born into this world was born with a divine purpose. And that purpose was given to him by the Creator. No one is insignificant in the eyes of God. No one is less valuable or important than another. A person called to be a nurse or a teacher is just as important in the eyes of God than a person who is called to be an apostle or a prophet or even the president of a country. Greatness is not found in titles. It is not found in degrees or even in the accolades of men. But it is found in being where God ordained you to be and doing what God ordained you to do. That is called greatness in the eyes of the Lord. Success also is not defined by wealth or status, but it is defined by knowing who God created you to be and by doing what you were born to do. That is called success in the eyes of God. Fulfilling the call of God, who, which he placed on your life, that is being successful. So, having said that, discovering that unique purpose for which God created you and I, and exercising our faith, and applying ourselves to fulfilling it, I believe is the key to living a satisfying and a fulfilling life. If you want your life to be fulfilled and satisfied, you must discover the divine purpose for which God gave birth to you, created you, and brought you into this world, and apply yourself to fulfilling that very purpose. Now, that does not mean you will not face opposition or resistance, but the opposite. 
you will be resisted and opposed in every way because Satan will target those who are pursuing God with all of their heart, fulfilling their purpose. You become a satanic target. But with God on your side, you will overcome every single time. You need to know that. And by his grace, finish your race and, of course, complete your mission. No devil, no foe, human or spiritual, can ever stop the person who is devoted to the will and the purposes of God and is willing to persevere in fulfilling that purpose. So in studying this subject, I want us to look at the life of Paul the Apostle as a model or an example who successfully fulfilled his God-given purpose and completed his mission before he went on to be with the Lord. So let us study his words carefully and don't just read the word. I want you to observe and meditate and receive the power that is in those words by which Paul gives his testimony concerning this very subject. And prayerfully, I pray that the spirit in which he wrote will capture your heart as he shares his secret of success with us. So we will look at several portions of scripture as a foundation for this series of lessons. And at the moment, we are going to read two portions of scripture. One from Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. I want you to mark these verses down and study them. Study them throughout the week. Let the spirit and the heart in which Paul wrote captivate and capture your own thoughts and your own spirit. And the second portion we will read from Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. So here we go. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 from the New King James Version. Paul writing to the church in Philippi, among other things, he said, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And Acts chapter 20, verse 24 But none of these things move me nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Praise God for his word. Now, these words that are written by Paul are spirit-filled and spirit-inspired. This is the way Paul lived his life in Christ. He was determined. He was focused on the goal. And his goal was to complete the task the Lord Jesus committed to him and, of course, receive the prize. Towards the end of his life here on earth, Paul said the following in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul made it, folks. 
he reached his goal. By his own testimony, he finished his race and he kept the faith to the end. And now, he said, he was waiting for the crown of righteousness which the Lord would give him at his appearing. Notice that he called his assignment the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That was the call of God from heaven upon Paul's life. In another place, he called it the heavenly vision, which he received from Christ when he met him on the road to Damascus. Testifying before King Agrippa in Acts 26, 19, he said, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. You see, God showed Paul exactly what his life would be like if he chose to obey the Lord and accept his mission. Speaking to Ananias about Paul's assignment in a vision, the Lord said, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. You see, Paul had a clear understanding of what his purpose in Christ was. He knew what God had called him to do, and that became his lifelong pursuit and his goal in life. And I believe that Paul gave us a pattern, if you would, or an example of how we should live our life here on earth. We should not live it aimlessly. We should not wander around in circles, going back and forth. We should know exactly what God had called us to do in every season of our life. You see, God deals with us in seasons. He will never show you his entire plan all at once. He will only give you a piece of that plan in a particular season that you are in. And I believe God expects us to be obedient to the light we receive in that particular season. I recall when I was born again, I didn't know very much. I didn't know much of the word. But I had this intense hunger within my heart and within my soul to know this person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who delivered me from the power of darkness and rescued my soul from hell. I had this unquenchable desire to learn, to grow. So I began to study, I began to read, I began to pray fervently every single day of my life. I would never let a day go by without praying at least 15 minutes a day in the early stages of my life. It was then, as I studied the Word, as my mind was renewed, as I devoted myself to prayer, that God began to give me glimpses of my divine purpose of which he had created me for. Believe me, when you see what God called you to do and you allow your heart to embrace the call of God on your life, your life will never be the same again. Amen? It will never be the same again. On that day when God begin, began to give me glimpses of my destiny, of the future that was ahead of me. He didn't show me the whole plan, but he gave me a glimpse. My life began to change from that very moment. My heart was captivated by the heavenly vision that God began to reveal to me. And it was in stages. And I, I had to obey what God was showing me at that particular season in my life. The same with you. If you're not obedient in the season that you're in now, 
And if you're not diligent to what God is calling you to do right now, there's no way he's going to give you added light or revelation concerning your purpose in life. So, first of all, we need to have a clear understanding of what our overall purpose in Christ is, and then concentrate our efforts, our energy, to fulfill it with the help of the Holy Spirit as he leads us one step at a time. You see, the Bible says that your word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. The word of God, inspired by the Spirit of God, will give you enough light for you to know what to do in that particular season of your life that you're in. And if you're obedient and faithful to that, he will continue to shed more light on your path. As it is written, the path of the just is as a shining light that shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. In other words, God will pour so much light on your path that you will have no doubt what the will of God is for you in that particular season. And the only way for you to miss it is that if you want to. So here, let's come back to Paul. For the sake of the upward call of God, Paul endured suffering. He endured fierce persecution and many other afflictions as he pressed toward the goal to finish the race. He forsook by his own testimony what was dear to him, including his past achievements, so that he could devote his energy to what was before him. He said, listen to his words. He said, I reach forward to those things which are ahead, and I press toward the goal. What do you think he was reaching forward to? I personally believe that the things he reached forward to were those good works which the Lord Jesus ordained or prepared for him beforehand that he should walk in them. And then he said, I press toward the goal. Now, pressing toward the goal denotes that he faced resistance and he faced opposition. Let me say this, walking in the center of God's will for your life does not mean that you will not have difficulties, challenges, trials, pressure, or opposition, but the opposite. The devil will oppose and he will target you in order to stop you. And if he cannot stop you, sidetrack you from fulfilling your purpose. But Paul made a quality decision. And that's the decision that every one of us needs to make. He would not allow anything or anyone to dissuade him, to distract him, or sidetrack him from his purpose. Amen. And as I have mentioned, Paul reached forward, I believe, to these good works which Jesus prepared for him beforehand that he should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 speaks about these good works that God ordained for every believer to do while here on earth. I want you to look at that verse from your own Bible. It's recorded in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. This is what it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Hallelujah. What a tremendous verse of Scripture to know that before I even got on this earth, before I was born, God 
had already prepared good works for me to walk in them, to do them in the name of the Lord. So every born again believer is created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God, according to the scripture, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now listen carefully. These good works that God prepared for you and for me are in the sphere of our calling and purpose. I want to repeat that because that's important. These good works that God prepared for you are in line and in the sphere with what God called you to do and what God purposed for you to do while here on this earth. Your good works might not be the same as my good works. We are not saved by our good works, and I trust you know that. But rather, we are saved for good works. And our faith in God and our love in God and his call upon our lives will certainly produce an abundance of good works because James says faith without works is dead. Love without works is dead. So if we have living faith and living love living within us, obviously that faith will produce an abundance of good works which God prepared for us to do while here on this earth. And these good works will ultimately bring great glory to our Heavenly Father, as Jesus taught us in Matthew 5.16. Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, this should be our purpose in life and the one goal we should pursue with all our might. Fulfilling the call of God and completing these good works the Father prepared for us to do in Christ Jesus. And let me say this. There is no safer place to be than in the center of the will of God for your life. You can be in the middle of a war zone. You can be in the middle of plagues and disasters and earthquakes. But I will tell you this, if you are in the center of the will of God, that is the safest place to be. Amen. Being where God called you to be and doing what God called you to do. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, seek first. First, not second, not third. This should be our primary goal in life the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added to you. Praise God forevermore. So seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness means that we become heavenly minded as opposed to being bound by the things here on earth. I want you to look at a verse of scripture. I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. Another translation says, we have been raised together with Christ. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above, for that is where Christ sits, enthroned at the place of all power and honor and authority. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts. Now here's the key to fulfilling the will, the call, the purpose of God for your life. Fill your thoughts with heavenly realities 
and not with the distractions of this natural world. Believe me, this natural world has many, many distractions. Jesus spoke about it in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. He said that the cares of this world, the worries of life, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things entering into our hearts and minds choke the very word of God from us, and we become unfruitful. These are the distractions of this present world. But if we fill our thoughts with the heavenly realities, with the promises of God, with the word of God, then there will be no room for the distractions of this natural realm. Your mind can only hold one thing at a time. And that is why the scripture says, feast on the realities and the treasures of heavenly realm. That is, folks, a heavenly mind. Or, in other words, a renewed mind. One that's been refurbished and renewed and restored by the word of God and the spirit of God. So to complete the task, listen carefully, of our heavenly vision, we must first obtain a heavenly mind. This is a mind that is set on things which are above, as I've mentioned to you, and not on the things which are beneath. Folks, so often we forget the fact that in the eyes of eternity, we are only here for one single moment. When you measure your life on the earth, however long you live, 70, 80, 90, 100, 120 years, in the light of eternity is only a moment. Furthermore, the scripture says that we are visitors and strangers as our fathers were, and our days on earth are like a passing shadow gone so soon without a trace. That's how the scripture defines your and my life here on the earth. In fact, James says, for what is your life? It is only a vapor or a little cloud that appears for a while and then it vanishes away. Think about that. And think about your purpose. Soon, all of us will be gone from this earth. And the only thing that will follow us into the heavenly realms are our works. Scripture says in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, Revelation 14 verse 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. The only thing you and I are going to take into heaven and the only thing that's going to follow us there is our works. The works that we have done while here in the body. You cannot take any silver or gold up there. You cannot take any degrees. You cannot take any titles. <laughs> Nothing like that. The only thing that's going to follow you and me are the good works that we have done while here in the body. And these, of course, are the works of love and the works of faith. The works we have done in the name and in the person of the will of the Lord. So, don't you want to have that assurance while you're still here on earth? that you are indeed pursuing the will of God and doing what God the Father has ordained for you to do? You mean to tell me that there is a way of knowing and being assured 
that we are indeed walking in the will of God for our lives? Yes, there is a way of knowing that. But in order for us to know it, our mind needs to be renewed. And we're going to read a verse of scripture here that will prove to you. Listen to what Romans 12 verse 2 says. There is a way of knowing that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2 says from the Amplified Translation, do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves. Prove what? What is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God? Even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in His sight for you. The New Living Translation says it this way. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect. There it is, the key to knowing that you and I have chosen the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God for our lives is by obtaining a renewed mind or a heavenly mind. And there's another way that you can determine or that you can be assured there is a satisfying sense within your spirit deep down. This is what we call the witness of the spirit, that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know, you cannot explain it in the natural, but you know that you are walking in the center of the will of God for you in this season. There will be a rich, satisfying, joyous sense within your spirit. But if you're not walking in the will of God, there will be a dissatisfaction inside of you. Deep down, you will know that something is missing. And you will start searching. And so often people search in the all the wrong places to find that satisfying, fulfilling sense. But you will never find it until you connect with the will of God for your life. And until you are placed where God placed you to be and doing what God created you to do. That's where the satisfaction is. You will have the joy and the assurance that you are walking in the will of God for your life, at least for that particular season that you are in. I believe that the only reason born-again, spirit-filled believers are so attached and attracted to the things of this world is because of their unrenewed minds. You see, an unrenewed mind does not value what God values. A worldly mind will value the things of the world. A heavenly mind will value what God values and will place priority in what God places priority. And the only reason we are sidetracked and easily distracted, I believe, from fulfilling our God-given purpose is because we have not taken the time to seek God diligently with all of our hearts through prayer and the study of His Word in order to obtain this heavenly mind. And the good news is that it's not too late to start now. As we enter this new season, this new year, make a quality decision that you will value and give priority what God gives priority to. It's not too late to seek God with all of our hearts. For he promised in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 and 14, that if we seek him with all of our hearts, we will find him. And in finding him, we will find ourselves. 
And in finding ourselves, we will find our purpose in life. And we will begin by faith, step by step, to walk in that very purpose. For me, it is my earnest desire for my spiritual household that we establish two things in our lives. And these are, are, are what, what I call the two wings of an eagle Christian who soars above the challenges of life and catches the wind of the Spirit and moves with God. And these two ordinances are vitally important for us to catch the wind of the Spirit, catch the heart of God, the mind of God, and move and co-labor together with God. Number one, the diligent study of the Word of God. The diligent study of the Word of God. Make that a priority in your life. Learn to love the Word of the Lord. If there are two things that have helped me to maintain my track and keep my focus on Jesus, not being distracted, not being sidetracked, are these two things, my love and devotion to the Word of God and my love and devotion to my prayer life. The second thing, establish a strong and a consistent prayer life. I don't believe that any one of us will ever be able to fulfill the will of God for his life without having a strong and established and consistent prayer life. Stop this nonsense of being in and out all the time. One day up, one day down. You pray one day, you neglect your prayer for the next three, four days. You read your Bible one day, you put it on the side for a whole week. you got to stop that. That is far more important than your job, far more important than your family, because if you take care of your spirit, you take care of your faith, your faith will take care of you, and it will take care of your family, and it will take care of your business. But if you neglect this, everything around you will suffer the consequences. You will begin to backslide and you won't even realize it. You will be like, like Samson, who lost his strength. And the Bible says he did not know that the Spirit of God departed from him. Are you listening to me? These are the two wings of an eagle. An eagle cannot fly on one wing. He needs both. And if you and I are going to soar in the Spirit and going to catch the wind of God and begin to flow and move along with God, then we need both. And don't make this a religious exercise, but learn to love the presence of the Lord. Learn to just love just sitting in His presence and enjoying fellowship with Him, meditating in His Word and sharing your heart with him, because that's what prayer is all about. So having said that, I'd like to conclude in prayer. And I want you to, as we enter this new season together, make this a priority in your life. I cannot stress it enough that you will seek God with all of your heart. And when you find him, you will find fulfillment in your life. Amen. So let us pray. Father in heaven, we give you praise and thanks in the wonderful name of Jesus. We thank you for your precious word. We thank you for your spirit, which you have sent to live in us. And you promise that this blessed comforter, the blessed Holy Spirit, will inspire us, will guide us into all truth, will illuminate your word, and make the written word alive and active in our lives. We thank you for the gifts that you've blessed us with. And we thank you for the privilege of prayer. Dear Lord, please grant us mercy and grace that we may devote ourselves to seeking you with all of our hearts. That we may prioritize the things that are valuable to you. And we ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen.